The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it might not be obvious at your first look, but there's a theme of reconciliation running through today's readings. See a couple of looks like, really? But yes, really, I think these readings really are about reconciliation, about God's desire for us to reach toward God in repentance, about the call to live in the way of love for God and neighbor, and about a model for reconciliation within the church and the world. Two weeks ago, we heard the reading from a couple of chapters earlier in Matthew, where Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. That's one of two places in the gospels, two. Yes, two in all four gospels, where the word ecclesia appears church. And the other place? It's in today's gospel. And the language of binding and loosing is present here, just as it was in that reading from two weeks ago. Matthew is the only one of the evangelists who records these statements by Jesus. Matthew must have been particularly concerned about ecclesia, and about the integrity and wholeness of the faith community. Now, as I study the scriptures, I keep finding words that weren't intended to mean what I've been told all my life that they do mean, and words that were translated in ways that oversimplify or that don't capture the meaning, or even that were translated into words in earlier translations that mean something altogether different, and they've been carried forward, but they carry a different context now. And sometimes it's something as simple as whether you is singular or plural. Take our gospel reading, for example. I recently acquired a copy of the Unvarnished New Testament, a recent translation of the Greek into modern American English without using the influence of the theological thinking of the past 2000 years of Christian history. It's been eye-opening. For example, consider the word sin. We hear sin as a deep flaw in us as humans, that separation between our will and God's will the lack of desire for good that leaves us inevitably acting wrongly. Now, the Greek word that's usually translated as sin, with all the weight it carries, hamartia, is an archery term. And all it means 
is missing the mark. Didn't hit the target square on. It's not that our desires are for evil. It doesn't imply that. It's that we're not perfect. We want to do well. We want to do what's right. We try. We intend good. We aren't perfect, so we make mistakes. Well, that's all a shift. And then it turns out that there are a couple of words here that are not included in the earlier manuscripts we have of Matthew's Gospel. The words against you at the beginning. Somewhere along the line, someone added them. So instead of when a member of the church sins against you, it's not personal when a member of the church messes up. Changes the whole context of the passage. And then there are all the differences between Jewish culture of 2000 years ago and our culture today. Just a few, the rabbinic sources from that time say that publicly shaming someone was grounds for being excluded from the world to come. So public shaming was never going to happen. The divine was present when two or three people were gathered to study the Torah. That's our, where two or three are gathered, studying God's law. And what binding and loosing meant, well, that was language for what was forbidden and what was permitted. Jewish law also required multiple witnesses for a charge to be leveled against someone. That's why you take more witnesses the second time. And Gentiles and tax collectors? Bad guys? No, they were outsiders rather than members of the group. That meant they required evangelizing, not ostracizing. All of that changes our understanding of the reading. It turns it from a way of blame and a model to exclude to a model for reconciliation and particularly for reconciliation within a faith community. None of us are perfect. People will mess up. They'll make mistakes, unintentionally say something hurtful, step on toes, either literally or figuratively, or they'll act in a way that is counter to our baptismal covenant or counter to the life we're called to live as Christians. Sometimes they don't notice. Sometimes they're unaware of the damage done. And conflict arises because people care. And these mistakes tear the fabric of the faith community. In the statement of whatever you bind on earth, here the Greek you is plural. Jesus gives authority to resolve disputes and conflicts to all the disciples, then and now. This passage puts the responsibility for the wholeness of the church on the church community. Jesus is telling us this is how you heal brokenness within the church when it happens. He isn't telling us this is how you convince someone they're a bad person or throw them out of the community. Throughout the passage, the value of reconciliation and restoration of community is restored. You have gained your brother. Getting along with one another isn't always easy. And facing up to our differences also isn't easy. It's easier to think about how we've been wronged than the wrong we have done or the wrong done by others, past and present, from which we benefit. Facing up to that is hard work, 
but necessary for the well-being of the church, of the community, of all our society. And perhaps it begins with listening. Did anyone notice how many times Jesus uses a form of the word listen in the passage? Or did that go right past us? Listening, really listening with open ears, open mind, open heart is hard. It's difficult to hear what is said, not what we want to hear. And healing the rift in a community is even harder. It takes willingness to, recon to recognize where we've missed the mark, where our intentions were good or not, and how we've missed the mark. It's more than maintaining relationships within a parish, a partnership of parishes, or even a diocese. The work of reconciliation, of listening, of healing broken relationships is work that might benefit our society, our country, and our world as well. Hard work indeed. Both Paul and Ezekiel point us toward that reconciliation. Paul writes to the Romans to love one another reminding them to love your neighbor as yourself and that love fulfills the commandments. That same love of neighbor pervades the promises we make in the baptismal covenant. It's explicit in the fourth promise and implicit in the fifth promise as well. Those promises ask us to step out of our comfort zone, to seek and serve Christ in all, to strive for justice and peace and respect the dignity of every human being. Striving to keep those promises requires us to listen and to accept those who are different from us, to reject racism, sexism, genderism, and all the other isms. In our reading from, Zeke, from Ezekiel, God is speaking to the prophet Ezekiel calling him the sentinel who watches for the well-being and speaks to the house of Israel in exile in Babylon. God is holding Ezekiel as sentinel, accountable for speaking God's truth and calling to repentance all of God's people. The people had failed to honor their covenant with God and had maintained that they were chosen as special instead of chosen as God's servants. And the word Ezekiel is called to proclaim as that call to repentance is that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. God is not vengeful, but desires repentance, turning back from evil. God desires reconciliation now as much as in Babylon two and a half millennia ago. So what acts and wickedness should we repent? From what would Ezekiel call us to turn back? Toward what would Ezekiel call us to turn? We promise that repentance in the baptismal covenant. We promise to resist evil. Yet we are often blind to the evil around us and the evil done on our behalf. And we promise to proclaim the gospel by word and example. Do we live that example of the good news, even imperfectly? And so these readings raise a challenge for us. In this time of pandemic, of strife, of rampant divisions. How do we work to heal the church and the world? How do we work to bring about reconciliation? How do we respond to God's love by living the way of love in the world? Amen.